We all see Las Vegas from our own perspective. Some see it as a vacation spot, others as an entertainment mecca, while others see it as a place to go clubbing. Well, my guest sees it from all angles. He's Michael Sartain. He's a local celebrity and Vegas lifestyle pro with years of experience and expertise in the hospitality and entertainment industry, and he knows all the ins and outs of the Vegas scene. Michael's ready to spill all the secrets to most of you. So for everything about Michael, go to moamentoring.com, moamentoring.com. You can follow him on Instagram, X, Facebook, and YouTube, as well as the Michael Sartain podcast, which we'll talk about as well. And Michael, welcome to the show. Hey, good to have you. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Good. Well, it's not so much. I know you're so used to being a host on your own podcast. You said glad to have you. <laughs> yeah, I am. I mean, you're right. I've done, man, I probably, I'm probably in the 300 range of shows I've hosted, and then I'm at 550 of podcasts that I've been on. I believe it. I believe mm -hmm. it. Well, this will be a unique experience for you. This is the case yeah. where uh, you'll actually be totally different than any other podcast you've ever hosted okay. or been a guest on. So here we go. So tell us, first of all, about your background. How did you end up in Las Vegas and how did you end up in, in that niche in the sense that you're letting people know where to find different things, how to do certain things? What's your background? Uh, 2007, I was a, I want to say I was a first lieutenant. Uh, hold on, was it? Yeah. Uh, no, I was, uh, yeah, I was first lieutenant in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And I came here for the NBA All-Star Game. And my buddy was Kenny Smith um, from uh, uh, TNT inside the NBA. Right. So I went to his, uh, his NBA All-Star Game party, hung out that whole time. It was, it was a, a fun time, but I decided to spend the entire week in Vegas, which was good and bad. I, did, I had it saved up to a bunch of days of leave. I hadn't taken a, a day of leave from the military in three years. So I spent nine days in Las Vegas. And man, I just remember being like a Tuesday night or Wednesday night and having more fun with less effort than any other place I'd ever been in my life. Now, this is back in the day. So for those of you who don't remember, Jet used to be the spot on Tuesday night. Tangerine used to be the spot on Wednesday night. And on Thursday night, it's still Tao. Like it's <laughs> all these years later, uh, 17 years later, it's still Tao. So um, it's, you know, I came here. I had a great time. I just remember seeing some of the most beautiful women I'd ever seen in my life walking around, um, the girls here were all in shape. They were pretty. And then the locals, uh, if you were local here, you just get treated well. So whenever I remember when Britney Spears first opened, we got free tickets to that. Whenever there's a new show, Jeremy Piven got me tickets. Like whenever there's a new show we could go to. And then if you had girls with you, you could get a comp dinner at SDK. You get a comp dinner at all these different places. And then the best part, obviously for me, was um, I I know the, the nightlife directors because I've been here so long. And I go on stage at XS or Omnia or... Uh, live or zook and um and i'll be up there with you know watching the dj from like f six feet away and it's just the experience here is like living in a movie it's like living in an instagram post every celebrity i know comes visits here all my family members come visit me here there's no humidity which is great it's the reason why i left texas um and so i just spent one week here and i just knew i was like I'm, when i got out of the military i'm absolutely positively going to move to las vegas um and so I moved here, and uh, when I moved here, one of the things that happened is I started working in nightlife. And if, if you work in nightlife, especially as an independent host, I wasn't an independent host, but I work with an event planning company. Mm -hmm. um, when you do that, you have to know where all the best spots are. Uh, for instance, when my friends come to Vegas and they're like, I got a guy, they're talking about me some of the time. So you're talking about you got a guy. Some of you guys will have a VIP host. Uh, some of you guys will have just a... Um, a casino host or whatever, but you'll have a guy. Sometimes it'll just be a local who knows someone who knows someone. Um, girls will come in town and be like, hey, I want to set up a, a bachelorette party or a birthday party. I just know the right guy to call. And then all of a sudden the girls are, you know, sitting for free on stage at, at, at Jewel next to Steve Aoki. You know, so I just uh, created a kind of a, a system like that. And then the other thing is one of my favorite things uh, in this whole city are the bikini competitions. There's been bikini competitions in Vegas for 20 years, all the way back to rehab. And, um, and I'm the host I've hosted probably at this point coming up near over 55 bikini competitions here. And then I also host the costume competitions for Tao Hakusan, and I'm doing one on Sunday. And it's just one of these things where it's like when you needed to know where to go and what to do, there's just such a cool industry nightlife here compared to any other city. And when I say industry, I mean, not Friday and Saturday, every other day of the week, Tuesday at uh, Omnia, Monday at Jewel, Wednesday at, you know, either go to Cassie Beach Club or you go to the Win. On Thursday, you go to Hakkasan or you go to Tao or you go to Zook. Um, Sunday, you go to Excess uh, or you go to Dre's or whatever. It's like, it's just this, the nightlife in the city is just incredible. And um, and then, you know, on top of that, Red Rock Canyon, 
Mount Charleston, Gene Lake bed. Like there's so many things to go and so many places to go. And then you're only 275 miles away from Los Angeles. So that's another thing. So, I, I mean, to me, I've, I've been the biggest proponent of people moving here. Uh, and I think it's backfired. I think too many people have moved here. We're turning into <laughs> Austin, Texas. Uh, please don't turn this place into Austin, Texas. Uh, cause that's where I, I'm, I used to live in Austin. It was, it was, and I told people to move to Austin. And next thing I knew Joe Rogan and Elon Musk are living in Austin and the whole city's changed. Vegas is just like, if you live here, you guys have to understand on the weekend, for those of you who visited, that is not Vegas. That is, you're just, you're going down a funnel that the casinos have built for you as a tourist. Mm -hmm. When you live here or you stay here during the week, it's just so much more of an easy flowing, beautiful city that has no traffic, no state income tax and no humidity. And it, it's just absolutely terrific. But just like having just the concept, like, again, Ira, if you, if you and had 10 guys with you and we were in Miami and I said, Hey, let's go to Mr. Jones or let's go to live. If you had a hundred thousand dollars, you could not get into Mr. Jones. In Vegas, I can walk up on a Tuesday to Omnia and get 10 guys in, no problem. And and it's actually a better club than anything they have in Miami. That's the, that's the great thing about this place. Why do I hear the sound of more Texans moving to Vegas after that speech? Mm. Dude, I get this. But it's the Texans I'm not worried about. Texans, <laughs> Texans they do fine. It's they have Cal a beautiful California, story. as you got to worry yeah, about. Yeah, it's the Californians, yeah. The <laughs> Texas, they got no state income tax, beautiful weather, beautiful women. Everybody owns a gun. It's great. Texas is wonderful. The place the, here, this... Um, it's funny because people don't grasp it when I say this, but Austin, Texas, 25 years ago was so fun. It was the live music capital of the world. So I used to live in the live music capital of the world. Now I live in the entertainment capital of the world. And there's lots of similarities. There weren't giant casinos in Austin, but like the concept of like steakhouse strip clubs, like that's a big thing in Austin. That's a big thing in Vegas. Uh, the, you know, no state income tax traffic was terrible in Austin. That's something that was different, but like walking around nightlife, on a Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday and just like meeting cool people. That's a very much an Austin thing and very much a Vegas thing. And then also being treated really well as a local is an Austin thing and a Vegas thing going out to the lake and going wakeboarding is an Austin thing. And it's a, it's a, it was a, uh, it's a Vegas thing. So that that's why I like the, I, I see the city's very comparable. Uh, Nashville is another city that I see that's, it's very similar. Without the humidity though, here. Compared yeah, to I mean, Nashville is super humid. But yeah. the, the thing is, like, we've got, we've got, so they've got six in Vegas they've, or in Austin, they got Sixth Street. And then they've got, uh, what is it, Broadway in, uh, in Nashville. But here mm -hmm. we have Fremont and we have the Arts District Correct. and we have the Upper Strip and we have the Lower Strip. So, like, we have all this and we've got the whole, like, complex out there in Summerlin and the other one in Henderson. Like, so we have, like, five times, we have something, akin to five times the French quarter in Vegas, mm -hmm. as far as like going out and just having a great time. And I've lived here for 13 years and I'm still discovering new places to go out and party like the neon sign museum or, or, or the arts district, or when people have first Fridays, there's just limitless things. There's museums and escape rooms. And like, there's just, there's so much of it here. And people are like, well, yeah, I wouldn't want to live my life like that. But my point is when you guys are gone, when the tourists are gone, like in November, <laughs> don't know, like a Wednesday, all of it is open to you. Like you can go, Correct. like they have industry nights to go shooting at the shooting ranges. The city is just amazing. So it's like, I've never lived in a place where I had to do less work to have more fun. When do you sleep? Mm. Just for those, listening, to noon. for those listening, like, that slight pause by Michael's because he's drinking. Yeah, uh, some kind of four, camp four, soda or something. Yeah, uh, four a.m. to noon. <laughs> four a.m. to noon. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been late recently. I've been doing. Uh, I've been doing. So the reason why. So I, I work in finance, and the markets close at um, one p.m. Uh, here, four p.m. in New York, and so I would. I and I only trade the last two hours, so I would. I would trade from eleven a.m. to to one p.m. and that's all. Three to eleven is pretty much when I sleep, uh, and it's great because people will come in town. And they'll be like, hey, Michael, take me out to see Tiesto. I, like, I like Tiesto. It's just I've seen Tiesto 100 times. And, like, I usually don't stop my Friday night to be like, hey, guys, let's go see Tiesto. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, again, he's great. I'm just I've seen him so many times. I'll go see Tiesto if he plays on a Tuesday at, at uh, Omnia for sure. But uh, they'll want to go. And so I'll get out of bed and I'll be like, all right, guys, I'll take you guys there. And here's my favorite thing, Ira. My favorite thing is when people come to this city. And they're like, I oh, mean, I can't wait to see Rufus to Soul. I can't wait to see Dead Mouse. I can't wait to see Cascade. I can't wait to see Tiesto. I can't wait to see Calvin Harris. So it's like, all right, we'll be ready and we'll come pick us up at 1030. And I'm like, why do you want us to be to pick you up at 1030? It's like, so we're ready to go to the club. And I'm like, 1030 is when we go to dinner. What are you talking about? We're not going to go to the club at 1030. Nobody's at the club at 1030. It's like, well, okay, what time? 11? I was like, 
no, the DJ comes on at one, 1 a.m. And they're like, what? And I was like, and they, they like argue with me about it. I'm like, every DJ at every nightclub in Vegas forever comes on at 1 a.m. and comes off at 3 a.m. If you didn't know that, now you know. So yeah. when you guys are like, I'm going to have dinner at seven and then get ready to go to the club, you might as well go home and take a nap and go go to the gym or whatever. People just, and they won't believe me, Ira. No matter how many times I tell them, they're like, what times does the club close? And they're like, they don't. Like, you guys remember, Dre's used to go till noon. Dre's after hours used to right. go till noon. And then guys would leave Dre's and they go straight to Wet Republic, like straight to Wet Republic with no sleep. Uh, you know, changing into a sw swim trunks in their car with no sleep. You'd have VIP hosts go 48 hours, no sleep because they'd have to go nighttime, daytime, nighttime, daytime, and they'd have to stay with their, their, their clients. And man, and I'm just telling you, like people don't understand those, you come out of Dre's and you would see the sunshine or the Rhino coming out of the Rhino. And it's like, the sun is shining. It's, there's nothing like it. And that's, I mean, it's just a fun experience. But the thing is everything I just explained to you, like you can spend money and I recommend you do. I just like, if you're a local here, you don't like, I've never had to pay to get in the Rhino. I've never had to pay to get into a nightclub. I've never bought a bottle. I've never done any of that stuff. And as a local, it's just, it's one of the benefits that you get from this place. And like, r realistically, most of the, the acts here, if I, if I message them and say, Hey man, I'm a local, I got a podcast or whatever, they would just give me tickets to come on especially during the week it's just such a great it's such a great gig max major is another great thing about this city i don't know if you guys know who he is he's this world-class um illusionist and he walks around fremont and he just hypnotizes people like this is just crazy stuff like that, that you see in the city that you don't see anywhere else yeah um and so well, that's you what i like about it you mentioned two things which i would disagree with you on one is traffic and the, the one you didn't mention it but i'll mention it is parking because that's changed over the years so now there's yeah it used parking. to be free everywhere yeah, yeah. you just be free. And you can sort of get in certain places you can get for first three hours free in that sense. But I could just so see if you show a Nevada ID, you can mostly get it free. But you're right. Some places like, for instance, Resorts World is now $18, even if, you, if you're there for 10 minutes, which sucks, because that's where I go watch. You know, I go to Zook all the time. But you're right. For the most part, it's free. Also, uh, Circa is $15 for like notes. I, I don't know why. They used to, what happens is you just scan your Nevada ID and they just let you go for free. Yeah, yeah. How do people get hold of you? I mentioned, and I'm going to give it out again, and I want to talk about your website and also your podcast, but if people want to get hold of you, how do they, what's the best way for them? Yeah, to Michael, them? Michael Sartain on Instagram is kind of the best way. So I'm a okay. performance coach. I'm a former U.S. military officer. So I actually coach men on how to be better leaders, better networkers, better communicators, yeah, and then that, also teach dating. That, that, that's that's at that, MoaMentoring.com. Yeah, at men, men of action, mentoring.com. That's exactly right. right. So I, I, I teach all those things. That's my main job, but my coaching ground or my battlefield, you know, like seals go to seal training in, in, uh, in, um, in San Diego, uh, in Coronado, my, my battleground where I teach my guys is I take them out to the loudest, meanest nightclubs in Las Vegas that are the hardest to get into. And I teach them how to talk their way into stuff how to talk to girls in the loud, with the loud, the most lights and to overcome their approach anxiety. That's what I do. And I do that one week a month. It's called Vegas immersion. And then I have a curriculum uh, that's about 65 hours long. It takes about six months to get through the entire curriculum that I coach. And so much of it has to do with Vegas because Vegas is not a typical nightlife scene. Vegas is the extreme nightlife scene. And if you can make it here, then when you go back to Des Moines or Wichita, you're going to crush it. You're not going to have any trouble. If you have, if you have no trouble going up to a woman who is the most beautiful woman you've ever seen in a nightclub that is incredibly loud with ropes and security guards everywhere and other other really good looking guys, and you talk to her and you're able to get her number in Las Vegas, when you go back to Waco, Texas, you are going to crush it. You're not going to have any trouble whatsoever. So we we don't we like the other reason why I like Vegas is coaching men here. It's because it's harder. And, and because of that, they can overcome their approach anxiety much easier. So you founded Men of Action in 2019, right? Yeah, so we founded 2019. We released the first program in October of 2020, and okay. then we were under new management. Basically, I took over the company in uh, June of 2021. Okay, because I started up Men of Inaction in about the same. Oh, yeah, that's era. a good one. Hey, let me tell you something. That, yeah. that you could just teach mindset, trauma <laughs> release, mindset. Feel good about yourself. Stand in the mirror and clinch your butthole and be like, exactly. I love myself. I love exactly. Men of Inaction. What a great course. I like that I, idea. I, I save all that wear and tear having to go to the clubs. You know, I just stay home and uh, that's it. it works I, 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 I promise you, if you went to a nightclub with me, it would not be like any experience. I have people all the time that come to Vegas. I'm like, I, I fucking hate nightclubs, bro. I hate nightclubs. And they go with me and we just effortlessly walk on stage behind their their favorite DJ and the owners like offering them drinks. And then we're dancing and I introduce them to the prettiest girl they've ever seen in their life. And they're like, okay, this is great. It's like, yeah, this is not your experience. Right. Most people's experience, you're getting funneled onto the dance floor. Yeah. And, and so uh, if you have that experience from like living here, 
It's like being on stage for Rufus the Soul, being on stage for Steve Aoki, or being on stage for Dead Mouse. There's nothing that compares to it. Like anywhere in, I don't care if it's Coachella or EDC. And by the way, we have EDC here too, like which is the biggest EDM festival, I think, in the world. At one point it was. I don't know if it still is anymore. It's definitely the most fun. Um, we have that here too. So, I mean, there's just so much stuff that has here that happens here. And the other thing I'll tell you is if you guys ever decide to move here, I used to live in Wichita, Kansas and Macon, Georgia. You know how many times my parents came to visit me in Wichita, Kansas and Macon, Georgia? None. Never. None. <laughs> I, I live in Vegas. They come see me twice a year. I don't even have to ask them. Oh, yeah. So that's another great thing. It's like all your friends from high school, all your friends from college, all your friends from like, if you work remotely, everyone will meet you in Vegas. Every Guaranteed if you live here, every single one of you. You know, the richest man in the world is Elon Musk. And I guarantee you, he will be in Las Vegas twice a year, at least. I guarantee you, he will. So like when you come to those realizations, Every celebrity you can think of, all of them will be in Vegas a couple of times. And if you like really pretty girls and you see really pretty girls on Instagram, I guarantee you every one of those girls will come to Vegas at least once a year. So that's the thing about it. That's just so terrific. Um, that's why I like being here. I don't, I was a military officer. I was an air force officer for seven years and I started to like, I don't like traveling anymore. My back can't handle it. I'm just too old. I just don't like doing it. And I don't have travel. I can stay in Vegas and everybody comes to see me, which is which was yeah. so great. Well, that's my in action program too. I just, yeah, your in action program. In. Yeah. But by the way, by the way, I just let you know, I live on the strip. Like I'm, I'm in my uh, condo, like right on the strip. And nice. I pay, I'm, I don't care if people know this. I pay $2,600 a month for a condo on the strip. Nice. Try to do that in Los Angeles and tell me what that buys you. <laughs> that buys you a that buys you a studio flat in, in El Segundo. Are you kidding LA. me? Try for twenty six hundred dollars a month. Tell me what you get in Manhattan. Tell me what you get in Brickell for twenty six hundred dollars a month. Right. I have a two bed, a beautiful two bedroom apartment over the Las Vegas Strip. Like I can see the race cars driving in F one. Are you kidding me? There's nothing that compares <laughs> to this place. Nothing. Now, how do you stay organized because you're doing so many different things? You, you're getting people into here and you're getting people into there and then you're running the website and you're mentoring and you mm -hmm. got to get some sleep in there as well. And you're working on new projects because you're a type yeah. eight. I get all that. So, but how do you, how do you organize yourself to be able to pull all that off? Yeah. Two books I'll recommend for everyone. Uh, one is called Buy Back Your Time by Dan Martell. Uh, where so every one of those things so I have a concierge like I have a host that works in for every one of the nightlife groups that I'm going to call whenever somebody asks me for something so if I want to take someone to Omnia then I'm going to take them there and I know the host I'm going to talk to Trevor at the door or I'm going to talk to you know Matt Roman at the door but if I'm not going to go there then I'm just going to text one of them and then and then I'm going to text them the pictures of the girls and be like can you make sure these girls get on stage always hand them so it's I'm de so delegation is the answer. When I make right. my clips on, you guys see I, I post uh, three or four clips a day on on Instagram. Those clips are made by my team, and I delegate. So buying, so hiring people to give you back your time is the best way to scale. That's the best piece of advice. And the answer you would take, you would use is figure out what an hour of your time is worth and divide that by eight thousand. I know it sounds crazy, but it's like so. Figure out what your yearly income is, your mm -hmm. yearly income. Divide that by eight thousand, and that's what one half that's a, that should come out to one half of what you're, you're worth per hour. That's what you should be paying assistant. And does that make sense? Yeah. And so that's where, I, that's where I come up where, for my hourly rate. Now, obviously if I have video editors who live in like Nigeria, it might be less than that, but that's how, that's the first way is I delegate. The second thing is, is a great book called the one thing by Gary Keller. And it goes over specializing in one thing, becoming elite at one thing, and then learning how to focus on one thing for four hours at a time so that you can do deep work. Uh, those two things have helped me immensely as far as being able to, you know, run the two companies. A Vegas Immersion is a, is a, a separate company along with uh, um, Men of Action, and then right. also having uh, the Michael Sartain podcast, which is its own entity as well. Yeah, I want to talk so, to you about that. Yeah, yeah, let's talk about the podcast. So, you approach it from what point of view, and also from because you and I talked briefly before we started, and you have a certain approach that obviously differs from mine and other podcast yeah. out there. So tell us how you approach your podcast to the subject matter type of people you have on. So the 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 ultimate the core of my podcast is evolutionary psychology. And in that I'm, I have some similarities with like say Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan talks about evolution a, a lot about on, on his show as well and has a lot of scientists. But the difference between me is where Joe Rogan will specialize with um you know a lot of MMA uh people he'll specialize with a lot of navy seals and then he'll have a lot of doctors on there talking about and a lot of people talk about conspiracy theories i right. have a lot of entertainers on my show i have a lot of models on my show uh and then i i my my main core focus is the concept of evolutionary psychology which is not so that's dr david buss lita cosmetes stephen stewart williams uh jeffrey miller like guys like this and this is the concept of how natural selection has shaped our brains uh and then so what i'll do is 
I'll have an evolutionary psychologist on and he'll explain, you know, things like parental investment hypothesis or mate choice copying. These are concepts in evolutionary psychology. And then I'll have a porn star on. And this girl is what like, try, but, but she's, but she's <laughs> trying to find love. She's trying to find love. She's like having real problems in her life. Right. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to take some of these theories and then just trying to like seeing how they fit in her life. Or I'll have Dan Bilzerian on and Dan was like, I've slept with 2000 women. I was like, okay, so how do these theories from evolutionary psychology fit? And it becomes this really fascinating, um, you know, in, in physics, there's an experimental physicist, and then there's a theoretical physicist. And the scientists, I consider them theoretical physicists, I consider myself an experimental physicist, meaning like the concepts from evolutionary psychology, I will often implement in my own life day to day. And then I'll go back to some of my friends like Satoshi Kanazawa or da David Buss or whoever. And I'll actually say, hey, Dr. Buss, this is an, something that I've done personally, and that it's actually worked really well as far as intersexual dynamics is concerned. And so I'm trying to I'm trying to make theory and practice fit each other, and I'm I'm trying to turn my podcast in sort of that place where theory and practice meet. What's your reaction, or what what is the reaction to your podcast from people do? They, do some people write you or communicate with you and say, "I'm fascinated by what you're doing, but I have no yeah. idea what you're doing." No, uh, the 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 me, the majority I get is so I get an unreasonably high number of shares of my podcast. There's been months where I get more shares than likes because a lot of people like to share my content but don't want their friends to know that they like it because some of the stuff <laughs> I talk about is very politically incorrect. So I had I had one month where I had I, I want to say I had seventy thousand likes and like eighty thousand shares, which and I showed my friends and they were like, I've never seen this before. It's pretty rare. So um, and I was talking to one of my friends. He's a so my friend is a plastic surgeon. Um, and he goes, Hey, I just want you know I'm one of the people you're talking about. I was like, I share your content all the time but i can't let my i can't let the other people in my office know that i like your content because it's, a, it's like somewhat controversial so just concepts like for instance um there's been multiple studies they've been corroborated dozens of times that show that in every uh, society throughout history men are more interested in in a, a variety of sexual partners compared to women and this is obvious like as a man you just know this to be true just anecdotally like a, a, going through the world you see this to be the case when you express that to some women, they get upset. They're like, well, I like multiple sexual partners too. And, 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 and it's like, well, it doesn't matter if you do or not. It, I'm not describing you. I'm just describing throughout history. This is just in general. I mean, the number is about two, meaning it's two standard deviations, meaning the median man, his desire for sexual variety would put him in the top two percentile of women. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Same thing with grip strength. So upper body strength, the median man's upper body strength would put him in the top 2% of women. You'll notice you don't know very many women who can bench press 250 pounds, but I know hundreds of guys who can. So like, so that there's a, there's a dimorphic difference there. When you discuss these innate dimorphic differences between men and women, some people, some women and it's some, but even fewer men find that offensive that you would even have this discussion. And when you really delineate it down, it's like, what is gender? You know, what, what is, you know, sex? What do these things mean? And we have discussions about it, but in my court, in my, it's not so much in my course, but in my, my podcast, there's no judgment whatsoever. I've said this before. If you, if you're a girl and you have a, you know, you've slept with 200 guys, I think you'd be a really fun person to go to the club with, but I don't want to marry you. Right. Mm -hmm. And so me just saying that comes off as judgmental, but I don't mean for it to be judgmental. It's just one of these things where there's a study by the GSS that shows that women who cheat in a relationship have on average 230, 230% more sexual partners than women who don't cheat in a relationship. And when I talk about that study, it makes women very mad. If I do a study showing that men, when they have more sexual partners before they're married, are more likely to cheat, men don't get mad. We don't care. If you tell men that they're overweight, men go lose weight. If you tell men they don't make enough money, they go make more money. If you tell, if you criticize men for almost anything, they don't seem to have an issue with it. But when you when you have the exact same criticism for women, they tend to take these things more personally, and you tend to get canceled. And so for me, I've been like, for instance, I've been totally ratioed on TikTok. TikTok hates my content. They don't want to post it. People will share my. They'll react to it. I'll have a couple of videos go viral and then TikTok will ratio every single thing I do. But on YouTube, I do pretty well because on YouTube, they don't, can't, they don't ratio you for having alternative mm -hmm. viewpoints. So it's that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think too, that the, you know, you're, you're raising interesting subjects of what I would call in a broader sense, human nature mm -hmm. uh, and not, uh, not, not limited just men or women, but just human nature in general how how humans behave, how humans interact with each other from yeah. a male and a female perspective. So that that does sound interesting. But what's the most positive feedback you've gotten from the podcast? Um, just people joining my program. I mean, if you, it's a high ticket program. I'm gonna, I'll tell you, it's more than a few thousand dollars to join the program. And we've had 1,600 guys mostly come from podcasts or podcast clips to join the program. Right, and at the end, at the end, anything for everything from tears to 
thank you for changing my life to I've, I've never had a guy go through all 114 modules and read all the books in the required list. I've never had a single guy do that and not tell me that it didn't change their life. Ira, what I tried to do was I took 25 years of mistakes and suffering and I put it down all the lessons I learned into one course you can get through in six months. That's what it is. And I tried to make the course just about one thing or two things, but it ended up being about 10 different ideas, including critical thinking, evolutionary psychology, event planning, social media. I, I made it about all these different subjects. Uh, and then also like I, I made it before, you know, during the pandemic. So certain things I've had to change over time, but the, the, the feedback that I get from people overwhelmingly positive. Uh, I have other friends that I'm with that I, that I go to conferences with that are coaches like me. And I tell them how low our refund rate is. And they look at me like I'm crazy. And they're like, how is your <laughs> refund rate that low? And then they're like, you, you don't, you obviously don't charge enough money. If your refund late rate is that low, these guys have refund rates in like the twenties and 30 percentile. If we ever had a refund rate above 3%, I would lose my mind. So that's another thing about our course is that we're just very, we're just very much about giving a ton of value. There's five other coaches besides me that work for me in the course. And our only job is to create a community where we give you accountability and feedback uh, so that you can improve in all these different spaces. And recently, a lot of our clients have been uh, uh, divorced gentlemen, maybe in their 40s or 50s, who are either having trouble financially or they're having their, you know, maybe lost a custody battle. Uh, that is the highest cohort for men to take their own lives in the in the entire of all of all cohorts. I mean, if, if, in fact, if you were going to say the highest likelihood of you taking your own life, it's a man who's been divorced and lost the ability to see his kids and then lost out financially. He is eight times more likely than the general population. And so we've made we've kind of curtailed. We've kind of uh, bespoke the course to gentlemen like that in some cases uh, to help mm -hmm. them so they can just get back out there. And so they, they have a, an opportunity because if you've been married for 10 years, do you want to know what's changed? Instagram. Instagram wasn't this big. It's like Instagram is now the biggest dating app in the world. And it wasn't like that when you got married, but it's now it's like that now that you're divorced. Yeah. And so we, we kind of give you a crash course on how to catch up when it comes before, to those concepts. Before I let you go, how do you mix or keep in balance those two worlds of yours, the Las Vegas party insider world and then the mentoring the coaching yeah the they're, coaching. they're, they're, they're very that? they're very similar it's like it's like it's like uh you know training to be a marine and then training for a um training for a marathon right it's like they're actually not that sim dissimilar if i'm training for a marathon i'm increasing my physical stamina if i'm training to be a marine i'm increasing my physical stamina it's so it, it's that kind of situation so they're actually very similar the when you think about intersexual dynamics what Las Vegas is, but I, I, I wrote this one time to Satoshi Kanazawa, he's an evolutionary psychologist, he, I believe he's at uh, the University of London. And one thing I said was Vegas is the apex of evolutionary psychology. And what I mean by that is it's the girls with the biggest boobs and the blondest hair going up against the guys with the most money, the most Bugattis, the most private jets. <laughs> and they're fighting for, there's, there's a struggle between them where they're like trying to let, they're at the rhino at 4 a.m. just trying to like leverage each other. It's like this incredible struggle b between this, the, the genders, but it's at the highest level, like the most exaggerated level where the, it's like the billionaire trying to pick up like the 21 year old blonde from cancer. Like, and they're just like this crazy struggle that goes on. And so that's why I love the city so much is because I think, again, it, when you want to study, uh, uh, when you want to have a study, what you want is a, is you want breadth and depth. And for me, what we're studying in Vegas from, uh, from an intersexual dynamic standpoint, we're four or five standard deviations from the mean. This is what the extreme looks like. But when you know what the extreme looks like, for instance, if you've ever flown an airplane, you always have emergency airfields. When you always have a procedures for if the engine catches on fire. This is what the extreme example of intersexual dynamics looks, for, looks like. Meaning, go to a club in, in your local bar or town, and a, a handsome guy comes up and talks to your girlfriend. You should be able to know how to handle that. Now, go to a club in Las Vegas, and Leonardo DiCaprio comes and talks to your girlfriend. What do you do then? You see what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's just, it's, so, it's more, it's bigger, it's crazier. But if you can handle it, and you can own it, you can own anything. The rest of the world becomes a, a, a joke. That's a great way to leave it. My guest has been Michael Sartain, local celebrity, Vegas lifestyle pro with years of experience in the hospitality and entertainment industry. And for everything about Michael, you can go to his website, MOA Mentoring, stands for Men of Action, MoaMentoring.com. Follow him on Instagram, X, Facebook, and YouTube. And of course, the Michael Sartain podcast. Michael, thanks for being on the show. Well, sure. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. See you next time.